Okay, guys, welcome to today's episode of the Kurt Miller Podcast. Today's guest is someone I have a I have a lot of history with, <laughs> a lot of history with, for many many reasons. Um, this man was an ex Coventry City teammate during my um, youth team days reserves, but this man also went a lot further than me when it when it came to professional football. We actually even went to the same secondary school, weirdly, and even went, we were even part of um, the same house group. It was like a, a different houses for different people within each year group. Um, and obviously we're from the same city, Coventry. Both had some ups and downs, which are very, very similar. And not many people know this, but Mr. Craig Peed, who is on today's podcast, also shares exactly the same birthday as me. So 15th of September, a fellow Virgo. So equally a little bit mental <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Both have obsessive traits, Peds as well, don't we? Um, and uh, and he's also now a large part of the amazing mission that we have inside Built to Last. Um, coming on our coaching team, he's definitely helped take things to another level when it comes to um, creating world-class results for our clientele inside Built, Built, Built to Last. So first and foremost, Craig Peed, thank you so much for giving up your time today. On Thanks the, for the intro. The, on the Kirky Miller podcast. Yes, pleased to be here. <laughs> Love what you're doing currently. Um, obviously, I listen to the podcasts. And um, yeah, pleased to be here. Good, good. Looking forward to a good chat. 100%. Um, we, we, we'll probably do many more together because we're obviously a little bit capped for time today. But um yeah, me, me and Craig, we, we've got some stories, haven't we, from our football days and things like that. But I think the one thing I really respect about Craig, and I suppose I did when I first came to Woodland School, that was our, obviously secondary school we went to, was I was very, very well aware from from that, from when I went to Woodlands, that you were a phenomenal footballer and you were two two years older than me, school years as they are. Um and and obviously being obviously obsessed with football and, and aspiring football myself and being at Coventry, picked up by ten. I think you were, were you at Coventry, picked up. What age did you get picked up by Coventry? I think it was younger than that, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was like seven, seven, eight, S seven. But you know, when you're that obsessed with football and you're trying to be, become a footballer, you, you're always well aware, especially in a city like Coventry, of who the the better players were. And and so to be in the same house as Craig, I remember in a week kind of way, it was, I was I was genuinely it was a bit chuffed, and I'd always try and look up to you. And any moment I could grab a conversation with Craig, and he was two years older, you know. I, I don't know, it was, I just like to, to, to really be inspired by people who are better than me at football, especially the old, old, older, older boys. But, um, um, but yeah, in terms of your story, Pete, obviously I've just said that you've been from, you, you were in Coventry, obviously you went, we'll, we'll elaborate on your football career and stuff like that. Um, but what, what was the dream to always be a professional footballer, you know, from an early age? So when did you realise that, that, that that was what you wanted to do? I think it was always the dream from a from an early age, from the moment you kicked that football. I think dad was involved in football. My dad was involved in football, so he played locally, and then he managed locally as well, like Sunday league teams and things like that. Mm -hmm. He was also a pretty horrendous referee, um, <laughs> so I was always in and around it. And I used to go. He used to manage a Sunday league team yeah. called the Standard Triumph, yeah. Uni Park back then, and um, he used to take me along to every. Every training session, I, I, I even like as I got older, because obviously sit and watch when you're six, seven years of age. Mm. But then as you get a little bit older, you start to kick a ball around and then mm. you go to the matches, you, you, you're kicking around on the pitch before. And this is only just Sunday league. So I was always around it. Um, and then I think you, you get that, the bug and, and the obsessiveness, obsessiveness about it. Mm. To, to always want to be playing it, always want to be watching it on TV, you know, anything that could be kicked, I was kicking. So whether that's, you know, some, some rubbish, a can of pop, yeah. a football, whatever it may be. So I think it then grew into a passion. I don't, I, I'm not a believer in if you're always around it, it's always going to be your passion because mm. my brother was always around it mm. and he, that wasn't his passion. And obviously mm. he didn't take to it like I did. So yeah. something must have clicked somewhere in them young years. And then the, just obsessed, just obsessed with it, obsessed mm. with watching it, obsessed with being 
and then you see these stars on the television and that's what you want to be and and it just takes over everything and you're you're a cover actually a coventry fan weren't you i was yeah i was, a coventry so I, fan. I was there, i'm the glory fan manchester united but yeah. craig was actually obviously a genuine fan um so so how did you get picked up by coventry first of all because you know again just to seed into the level that craig went to um you know he went to lillishaw which was like the national uh, football uh, school for basically the best players in the country as Craig will talk about shortly and he's roomed with well you, you, you're great friends with Joe Cole Joe Cole Joe Cole aren't you now um, yeah but um, but yeah when 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 did you uh, you know realise that uh, you know you, you were good and you think how, how did you get picked up by Coventry I think it all starts for anyone locally um, playing in the, the grassroots in your local town in your local city or village and no different to me. My dad was actually, um, he was coaching a Sunday league team, which was actually the year above mine. So I, I would go along and actually my age group, there wasn't a team. Mm. So eventually, probably me prodding and always being there, mm. I ended up worming my way into the team, as in into the squad, not into the team. Mm. And I was playing in a pretty decent um, local side a year above so mm. probably a little bit more physical and taller than me. So I had to learn pretty quickly and I was training with these a couple of times a week and then playing on a Saturday. Well, I wasn't actually playing. I was on the bench and coming on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, in the end, I ended up doing really well and get, getting in the team and being in the team quite regular. Mm. And then at any local grassroots pitches on a Sunday and a Saturday, you will see local scouts. Mm. So there were some notorious ones in Coventry called Ray and Lol. <laughs> who used to swan around and pick up um, any <laughs> any kind of talent available, pretty much in any town with a 50 mile radius, I suppose. So yeah, they invited me into a training day at the club. And then from that, I was invited to, to sign school of excellence kind of forms at the time was yeah, where you yeah, try you trained twice three times a week yeah. and you had a game on a sunday so yeah. you get to a certain level and then the grassroots stops and you have to play for the for the city yeah, yeah so yeah. that's where i was and then but in my own age groups so i was playing a year above on a sunday yeah and then um my own age group for coventry yeah. so i went into that system yeah and then you progress from there you either you either play until you get to the point where you get taken on as a scholar, which is um, academies, mm. or you get released. So, um, but on that journey, on the way to being a scholar, the two years previous to that was the two years, the, the last two years at secondary school. Mm. So back then there was a thing called the, the FA National School, mm. which was 16 of the best kind of players in the country would go mm. there and be residential. They would have school in there and they would train pretty much full-time also to kind of home mm. in on talent and you have to go through local trials regional trials national trials until they will you know wheel the whole country down into 16 players mm -hmm. so that's when you know with family you would travel all over the country for these trials and then the final national trials was at Lillishaw which is mm. the home of it was the home of English sport at the time so yeah when I went through all the trials and tribulations and stresses of that to then get into the final 16 to have to move away from home Coventry to go and live at the FA National School at Lillishaw with 16 of the best players in the country which was probably one of the best experiences in my life mm. hard because you have to leave home at the age of 13 14 mm. and that's just you know unheard of leaving home you know I think I think pretty much every 16 16 of us cried every every single night <laughs> before we went to sleep which was hard because you didn't want to show anyone you cry but then you look <laughs> in the next bed and someone's crying you're like what are you crying for and then he'd say and then so yeah it was tough six months to yeah. start off with but then two of the best years possible learning and playing with who did yeah. you play with yeah who was it who was that i know obviously it was it you you room with joe cole yeah so yeah. the first year i didn't room with joe cole i would with stuart parnaby who had a great career at middlesbrough Birmingham yeah. city yeah, yeah, yeah. um things like that Andrew Taylor, George Pilkington, who, who had good careers in the game. Yeah. And then in the second year, I roomed with Joe Cole and Ian Armstrong, which was, it was a room of three. There were some rooms of three, some rooms yeah, of yeah, four. Yeah. But at that time, I didn't class myself as one of the better players. I, I think I probably had to graft the hardest through them trials to get yeah. in that 16. Yeah. So I always thought I was starting from a little bit of a lower place with these 15 other lads. Um, 
and it was phenomenal because they were exceptional players. So to be in and around that every single day, working with them, and not being the best, learning from them was just incredible. Would you would you say, Pete, that was your first? I mean, you, you probably didn't realise it at the time, but would you say that was your first? indication of how valuable being around better players better people were in terms of forcing you to raise your standards up your game um because i'm guessing up, up to that point during when well, we were both went to a similar school where you're the big fish in a small pond and coventry is a small place right and i can't imagine i don't I, i'm guessing no one had ever been to lily shore up to that point you know from coventry so that was a big deal and and i'm guessing you you know by far the best player in the team in coventry and woodlands and all this type of stuff but was that the first experience where you thought Come on, I need to up my game here. And but by naturally being around people who were maybe better than you at a certain point, you were forced to fall into that standard yourself. Yeah, I'd say my f my first experience of that was probably before Lillishaw. Was when my dad took me into the overage for me a year above yeah. team locally, and I was nowhere near the best player. I was actually probably the worst player in that team to start off with because yeah, yeah. of my first time ever playing matches because it was always street football and, yeah. and stuff like that so then going onto a pitch with it you know physically physically these boys were way more advanced than me yeah so and then there were better football players so that was my first experience and I knew then I had to up my game back then so I'd kind of always weirdly enough now thinking about it when I've progressed is when I've always started in a pool of better or bigger fish mm. so you go to the year above um, and you're playing in that pool of players who are physically better, technically better as well. I had to up my game. Mm. I did, established a position in the team, excelled, then got into the School of Excellence. Again, you feel like you, you're not that best player again. Yeah. And then you have to up your game, up my game again. And then you go into these trials and then locally, nationally, mm. you're playing against better players. So then upped my game and then felt like I probably scraped into that um, 16. Mm. And then again, that was probably my first experience of elite, mm. the elite, because it was the whole country. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, and I don't th suppose at the time I realised what I had to do. Yeah. I just knew I had to probably work harder. Back then, I just thought it was giving my all, running around, tackling people. Yeah. And that was my all. But really, it was, you know, that work ethic of, right, you have to work harder because these are better. When you say work, work harder, because I know there's, if you work hard on the wrong thing, then mm -hmm. you're only going to get better at the wrong thing. But what, what do you, what would you say uh, really brought your foot, football uh, development on? Was it, was it repetition, I don't know, practicing your passing over and over? Was it more fitness? Was it just a, a weakness of your game that you just focus on over and over again? Like what, when you, when you first realised, shit, I'm a little bit out of my depth here, what do I do? What, be, elaborate on that a little bit. When you say work harder, what did you specifically do, especially with football? So fitness always, for me, I think because I was so competitive as a young yeah. young boy growing up, fitness was always, it, that wasn't the issue. It was the technical ability. So when I say work harder, yeah. you know, at my passing, work harder, at my defending, work harder, at my dribbling, work harder. At all these things when you're a young boy yeah. that are not necessarily game specific. Um, they are game specific, but what I mean yeah, is, yeah passing just being a better five yard passer 10 yard passer 30 yard passer so these are all the things that i would stay behind or get out before training and do mm -hmm. dribble pass and, and grab a few players with you so you can do it but then obviously going into that pool of players mm -hmm. you would then be at match tempo playing against players that's you know skilled quick mm -hmm. good at dribbling good at passing so it then automatically made my defending better because for the first two weeks i remember just getting absolutely <laughs> raped for uh, raped when I mean rape, I mean <laughs> people running at you and dribbling past you and scoring goals and I just couldn't get the ball at all. Yeah. It must have been for six to eight weeks. And it was frustrating because I was just like, I'm nowhere near this. Yeah. I'm a little bit confident knocking, but then the group was such a good group and then you work that hard and you day in, day out with with these great players. You then just get better and better. And I think it forces you to improve quicker, to practice more. And then because it's a daily thing, sometimes twice a day we would train, yeah. it's repetition of all these things. Yeah. And the repetition of all these things then led to the improvement, which you wouldn't get if I was at home yeah. um, playing on my own in the street. 
and, and then your brain improves with you know scenarios on the pitch and things like that and obviously the coaching is yeah. at a higher start standard yeah, 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 yeah. so yeah it was the working hard of of everything really before, yeah, 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 before yeah, yeah. after the training session uh, and you lived in an environment where it was football so it was just literally when you're on the pitch or not we're either in a classroom learning yeah, about yeah. it or we're off on the pitch learning about it and it was just so i suppose it was like a professional environment from an early age it's just yeah 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 from 14 you're basically living like a professional footballer where most people even if like, like me for example even though i was at coventry uh pete you know went through a similar journey to you the only difference was craig when you went to lillish or the center of excellence i actually missed out on that so i get down to the last 25 uh, peds and I didn't quite make the grade and similar to you I just found at that those those trials everyone was just as quick as me mm. anyone everyone was just as physically developed as me because obviously outside of that even when we used to play you know in our games for Coventry I always felt you know in our week to week games I'm a little bit quicker than everyone I'm a little bit sharper than everyone and then when you go to the best 25 players in the country and you think, shit, they're just as fast as me. If anything, some of the players were stronger. Mm. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it did make such a difference. So so I can imagine when you left there at 16, how did you define the transition then back to Coventry? And just elaborate a little bit more on your, your actual, how long you were at Coventry and then what happened to your football career from there for the list the people listening in. So yeah, so from the two years spent at Lillishaw and then you would be leaving school and then you would go and pursue a career or an apprenticeship or whatever yeah. it may be. In my case, it was football. So I'd always been a Coventry fan, season ticket for years. Mm. I was contracted at Coventry through the academy. But then going into pro forms, you could go to different clubs. Did, did, um, did, did anyone, because uh, I mean, I don't know this. During the period you were at uh, Lillishaw, did any of the teams try and turn your head a little bit? <laughs> or, yeah, or, I think or... it kind of get, it gets done between like parents... Yeah. And scouts and, <laughs> and managers. And I think, yeah, I think we'd been approached by uh, being at Lillishaw. Yeah. Obviously, there is a player from every single club pretty much in the country. Well, the top clubs. And obviously, they're watching their player, but they see all the other players. So, yeah, you know, there was, there was Liverpool. There was West Ham. I think at the time, pretty much any one of us, the 16 of us, could have pretty much gone to every any premiership premiership club in the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would have the choice. And at the time, Coventry were a premiership yeah. club um, were you tempted I think I was because I was very at that point I remember I was good friends with Joe yeah who was at West Ham Joe Cole, for who, anyone listening yeah he was yeah. obviously he was like how good was Joe Cole sorry to diverse I mean because we, we <clears> heard about Joe Cole obviously Joe Cole went on to play for West Ham play for England uh, Chelsea etc but he was talked about for years Craig of like literally he was like the next Pele he was he was <laughs> he was there were stories of him like taking on like five, six, seven players in a training match and and lobbing the goalkeeper or something. But yeah, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it, he was a, a prodigy, and he was the best I've ever seen. And I haven't seen really. Any, was it was anyone. he the best player you've ever played with to date? I think there was a certain point in his career uh, when he was. Um, let's talk about child prodigy. Yeah, when yeah, I yeah, was yeah. with him day in day out, he was the best I've ever seen. And to date, at that age, yeah. sixteen. He was the best ever wow. I've ever seen. Wow. I obviously haven't seen Ronaldo and Messi. No, no, but no, get it, get I it. would say at that age, he was probably on that level where he could have got, he, he, he would have been that good. Fucking That's how good he was. Crazy, yeah. um, so leaving the national school, the FA, the national school, yeah. I was very aware that I was good friends with Joe, but I'd say he was the one that probably drove me to be better because he was so good. So looking at him thinking, wow, every single day, yeah, yeah, yeah. and obviously him pretty much raping you every day yeah. it was just like he would be the standard weight that you had to be so he would drive that standard yes so we were such a good 16 i, I think because there were standout players like him he was the the pinnacle and everyone in the pre, pretty much in the world had heard heard yeah. of his name at that point yeah, yeah, yeah so he would drive the standard of how good we would be as a group yeah so when you come to leave i think there was part of me that was thinking uh, i had probably had the choice uh, the chance to go to west ham he was going there and I think yeah. my, th my mindset was it, it, it was not go there with your friend yeah. and it wasn't go there and, or don't go there and be scared that he's so good he's yeah. going to get all the limelight yeah. it was more of if I go there I know I'm going to be better. carried and be even better yeah. anyway 
I didn't go there. My my first love as football was Coventry City, so yes. it was it was always going to be that. Um, I was going back home. I wanted to yeah. to play for Coventry because I supported them, yeah, yeah. and I did. I went back and lived. I thought I was going to live at home, but I didn't. I got told I was living at the lodge, which is the training ground <laughs> at the time. So I was back with another sixteen animals to <laughs> to live a football life again. Yeah. Um, but going from Lillishaw to being you know, with that the elite. Yeah, yeah. Going back to commentary, you're still with the elite. Yeah. But I was then, I'd say I was then definitely in a better position than them 16 boys that we went yeah, yeah, yeah. into that. Because that was their first um, experience of full-time football. I'd living already and it, yeah. living and breathing it with, mm -hmm. with better players than me. So I'd say I was a little bit ahead of them by them. Yeah. Um, but then in that environment, if you're good, in training and good you get, matches, you, you get pushed through to yeah, the reserves, into first team. So there was always ways to progress and be with better players. Yeah. So um, talk to, to just how what, talk people through your Coventry City journey. Like when did you first make the first team, um, and how long were you at Coventry? Um, so was a, so came through at Coventry, um, and I was we we had a really good good 16 and we had a good run in the FA Youth Cup where we got to the final for two years running and um, that was when we were 16, 17 mm -hmm. and I was playing really well and Gordon Strachan was putting me in the squad and then on the bench in the premiership and I never forget it I was we, were, we had a reserve game I think I was on the bench at Leeds away mm -hmm. in the premiership and then we had a reserve game at Nottingham Forest away mm -hmm. on the Tuesday night so we went there and played and I remember it clearly. I went in for a tackle and tore my tore ninety percent of my cartilage. Shit. And I was playing well at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What age was this? This was when I was like I think seventeen. But such a pivotal age, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, you, just you just know. like seventeen because I'd done mm. so well from going in. Mm. And then I did that, which meant surgery. Um, and then you've got the recovery and coming back to that sort of season was gone. Um, and then yeah, do the you know it was hard because I was in such a good place. Never had an injury before, so it was a a, a big learning curve, a big yeah, shock yeah. to the system uh -huh. about recovery, about rehabilitation. So it was it was tough and a lot of discipline around that because I'd never done it before. So I'd, I can honestly say the first time I had to do re my rehabilitation, I probably didn't do it properly. Yeah, yeah, and I think yeah, the knowledge back then as well wasn't what it was now. So, no. so when, when did you when do you feel like you you, you finally made a dent properly in the Coventry first team? Because I know it was, and then I got back fit again and started playing in the reserves, and then it was I think it was eighteen or nineteen years of age. Um, it was away at Burnley when I made my de debut, mm. and it was kind of it was kind of funny because my idols would have been Paul Gascoigne and Gary Lineker, mm. and, and then some of the Coventry players at the time. And Burnley had just got Gascoigne back from... I remember. I think it was America. And he was coming to the end of his career and he was, you know, he was an alcoholic, drug addict. Um, and the manager said, uh, can you just pop in to a room before the game? I was away in a hotel in Burnley. And he said, oh, there's some good news and some bad news. Good news is you're playing, mm. starting. So obviously I was ecstatic and the, mm. the, the nerves yeah, started yeah, filling yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. And he said, the bad news is you're playing against Paul Gascoigne today. And he was my idol, and I was just like, wow, what a, what a day to make your debut. Um, and I remember it before, as we were kicking off, I actually pulled him and asked him for his top before kickoff. Before kick what yeah. did you say to him? He just, said, he just nodded his head at me and just put his thumb up. Yeah. And I kind of thought, oh, he's never given me his top. Yeah, yeah. And then he came off before the end of the game. I think he came off about 70 minutes yeah, yeah. and went straight down the tunnel. And even though the game was going on, I was just still thinking I'm never getting that shirt. Like, <laughs> mind weren't on the game, it was on his shirt. Um, and dressing room afterwards, manager's giving a team talk and it was obviously full time. And there was a knock on the door and he popped his head around his, he popped his head around the door and threw his shirt at me. So he'd remembered. And how did, how did nice. you do in your first game? And, and, and then did you get a more consistent spot in the team or yeah. how long were you at Coventry after that for? I yeah I did well I did well on my debut I, th I think it was a decent enough debut and then I think I was in and out because my injury was still it was still plaguing me a little bit because it had not healed properly and mm. I'd come back too quick mm. so I was going to say that season finished and I needed more surgery on my knee mm. so then I had more surgery on my knee 
and then I was kind of at Coventry. I, I was in and out because of injury, because of this knee, because I had at Coventry, I had three or four, four surgeries on this knee yeah, yeah, in yeah, the space yeah. of three or four years. Yeah, yeah. So I'd be in for a few games and I'd be out for a few games and in for a few games. I never really established, a, you know, a week in, week out where I'd be in for 10, 15 games. I'd say I'd be in for four, five, six, mm. out for one, back in for four, out for one. Yeah. In for one, out for one. So it's very bit part of Coventry. Uh, I, I suppose the hard thing for that, because I know even in my three years at Coventry, Pete, there's different managers coming in. Yeah. And when you are <laughs> getting injured and a new manager comes in, they don't know you. No. And it's a very lonely place, isn't it? You can be the best thing since sliced bread under one manager one minute, then someone comes in to the manager. They don't care what you've done up to that point, do they? They, they might have had you know, some of the members of staff going, oh, Craig's a good player, Kurt's a good player, whatever it is. But, but they've not seen you. They don't care because they need results there and then. So do you think that hindered you as, at all uh, over the years? Yeah, probably. Because because I wasn't probably an established first teamer mm. at Coventry. When, when the transition for new managers come in, mm. if you're not probably established. They're probably looking at the squad mm. and thinking, right, who needs to be moved on? Mm. Now, obviously, I'm in the management side of football yeah. and you look at it different as a coach, as a manager, because you've got to, you've got to come into a job and, and you know, you've got to get things moving. So, yeah, I'd probably... I understand it more now because managers would come in and you probably yeah. wouldn't be in the squad and you're thinking, yeah. I'm good enough to be in the squad, but yeah. then you're not in his plans. Yeah. So it's like, he's made that decision. It's nothing personal. Yeah. It's just, he's got his own plays he wants to bring in. He's got his way of playing. He's got his own style. Yeah. And yeah, it's, football's a big mind battle, yeah. minefield. Yeah. You've got to quickly, you know, come to terms with things and be resilient and move on quickly and work hard again. How, how, how many how many games did you actually play for Coventry then? And then and, and what where did you go then? Uh, is your next move? I think the Coventry actually worked out around like 55, yeah. 55, 60 uh, appearances for Coventry. Yeah. Three goals. Three, Three goals. <laughs> one absolute Cantona esque. Um, you should actually clip this to the podcast. So when I say that, we'll clip. <laughs> it's not quite in 4K back then. It was probably 1K. I remember the goal there. Um, yeah, lapsed onto a board. Dinked I, into I, the rem top I remember the, the, the shirts we used to have to wear. Like, for oh, some reason, they were quadruple like XL. Ex extra large. And I, don't, I don't know why. That always bothered me. I, I'll tell you. What? So remember Andy Harvey? <laughs> yes, the, Andy kit, Harvey, the kit man at Coventry. Yeah, he's probably about five foot nine. He's built like a brick shit house. And he's <laughs> probably wider than he is taller. Unbelievable guy. I still talk to him now. Amazing, yeah. But he said, he, he was the kit man. He ordered the kit. And he just said... If it fits me, it fits everyone. So he would get a shirt that fit him and order 25 of them for the squad. It's ludicrous looking yeah. <laughs> Oh, now you see how tight they are now. Like they're mediums and smalls and every player gets exactly what they want. Yeah, yeah. Which is towards the end of my career, that's what we had. But back then, it was Andy Harvey ordered what fit Andy Harvey then. If it fits Andy, it fits He's everyone. He's about 22 stone. Yeah, yeah. Hence why, if you look at any pictures now, of any Coventry team around about that time, about yeah. 10 years 12, well, 15 years ago. Yeah. It's, um, you're going to see players that look like they're wearing parachutes. <laughs> so, so after Coventry, where, where did you go? After Coventry, where did you go? So after Coventry, it was one day I was in the dressing room and Steve Staunton, who is a, a bit of an Irish legend, played at Villa. Yeah. He, he just handed me the phone and I was like, what? And he was like, someone wants to talk to you. Um, and on the other end was Paul Merson. And he was like, I've heard you're not featuring your, your contract ends at the, at the end of the season. Do you fancy coming to Warsaw mm -hmm. until the end of the season on loan and then looking at signing at Warsaw? So snapped his hand off, went to Warsaw. Um, How many years there? I had two and a half years at Warsaw. Didn't you get promoted as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Two, it was brilliant. The first year wasn't great. We, we, we didn't do very well. And then second year, unbelievable. Great, great group of lads. Um, all looking to you know all absolute machines in every sense and we won the league we won league two was that with Merson in charge no that was with Richard Mooney in charge I remember Richard Mooney was, 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 he was one of our he was like the head of youth wasn't he when we were at Coventry yeah. great coach but I thought he was a, he was a bit of a, a ballon personally yeah a lot of people do yeah he was a phenomenal coach really good coach really good tactician um, just I think could probably handle individuals a bit better man manage but yeah. some managers some managers like that they don't want to man manage people they just that's the decision that's it and and some are better at managing people and, so and, uh, talk, talk me through as well. <laughs> you've got to get this out in the podcast I remember you telling me about this Paul Merson 
the legend himself, but I know he's had his battles with uh, alcohol and gambling. Yeah. What was he like as a gaffer? I might, I, I might be, I hope I'm correct with this, but didn't you tell me a story once where he turned up at your house and dragged you out on no. the beers or something? He didn't turn up at my house, no. <laughs> um, I loved, I love Paul. I, I love Mass. He was brilliant. I, I think at the time it probably wasn't right for him to go into management because he was a player at Warsaw yeah. and then the manager went and I think the chairman and then said, would you, would you, would you take it on? He did. Yeah. Um, at the time he's probably not going through the greatest of times. I think, you know, I think he was drinking yeah. a, a, quite a bit as well, yeah. but, but he was drinking a lot, <laughs> but, and look, he's got a really, he's, he's amazing pundit. Um, he's very, he was always very knowledgeable back then yeah. uh, of, he would know everything about football. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Which is, you know, he shows that on Sky Sports News and whatever he does. And he was phenomenal. But he was the drunkest man and the best player. What do you mean? On a match day, <laughs> in training. So he could come into training and would have had a skinful probably the night before. Yeah. And you'd just be gobsmacked with what he can do at that age. Yeah. That's, you know, really later on in his career under the influence of alcohol. But unbelievable and yeah. he probably did this throughout his whole career playing in the premiership yeah, yeah, yeah. you know he, he, he's well. exactly the crazy. same yeah, a bit yeah. like Paul Gascoigne yeah. and it was the same on a match day he could have been on the, you know he could have been uh, I've had a few drinks the night before and be the best player on that pitch Mental. by a country mile Mental. so after, after Warsaw uh, what happened then with your football so after Warsaw um, they we, we actually won the league with Warsaw uh, in league two and then they were not offering anyone contracts mm. and we were all kind of getting a little bit itchy feet. The manager, Richard Money at the time, was yeah. saying he wants to keep this group together. Mm -hmm. Just relax, don't panic. A couple of players were. Um, and then he called a meeting uh, two weeks after we'd won the league. He called the meeting and we were pretty confident because of what we'd done. The majority of us were going to get contracts. Mm. Anyway, I remember walking into that office and he they just said to me, look, because of budget, I think it was it was a bullshit excuse. Mm. Because of budget, we can't really offer you a contract for next season. Yeah, yeah. So doing that, let me talk about you know handling players and things like that. Although it was just a, a poor way of doing it. Mm. They could have let us know early. I had not even looked for another club because I thought I was pretty safe. Yeah, yeah. I played 46 to 50 games, won the league, got in the t team, um, the PFA player of the year. Yeah. You know, I'd had a great season. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I'm looking forward to next season with Warsaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they deliver that to you. So it was another blow. So you, you have a representation at the time, an agent. So then he straight away put the feelers out. And I ended up going down to um, Brentford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. That, was, that, was that where you ended your career as well? Uh, yeah. With the knees. So what, yeah, age were you, yeah. what age were you then? And what type of age did you so fi got, finally finish your career? Which was cut short, obviously. I think I went to Brentford at 27, 28. Yeah. And I signed two years there. And my pretty much... The two years there was played with knee injuries. I had a couple of surgeries there yeah. as well. So I still played, you know, 40, to, maybe more than that. I can't even remember what, how many games I played for Walsall, but I'm um, sorry, Brentford. Yeah. But yeah, the, the knee was just, I wasn't training every day because I was in too much pain. Yeah. So I was managing the knee yeah. and kind of playing games and then not training as much as the other lads. You start losing fitness, you like yeah. start losing match sharpness and you just can feel yourself, you, you're not on that level. Yeah, yeah. And the final surgery, the surgeon... Um, Andy Williams in London just said to me, look, I'm not going to tell you to retire, but yeah. he was like, if you continue, you're going to be in a really bad spot and I don't feel you can do. So he said to me, for one, you can't sprint because yeah, my yeah, knee yeah. doesn't, the range of movement at my knee, I can't, even now, I can't fully extend it, I can't fully flex it. Yeah. Um, nowhere near. It doesn't go past 90 really. Um, so he was like, you've not been able to sprint for two years. You're not going to be able to, you're in pain all the time. Mm. You have to have operations to clear out bone debris yeah, that's yeah, in the yeah, joint yeah, capsule. Yeah. So I was just, I had to retire. And, and how did you, because I, I know that we've both dealt with this, but at different stages. And I've spoke previously, Pete, when I got knocked back by Gary McAllister at the age of 20, and that's why I have so much admiration for Craig. You actually obviously went that step further, not just with the Lillishaw thing, the centre of excellence, but also to, to squeeze out a career as long as you did with knee injuries. It shows the standards you had um, but how did you deal with that rejection you know where you thought fuck off I'm not a footballer anymore how did how like how did you deal with that it what was, did you do from there it was surreal because I think the season ended and then I was actually gonna try and get another another year at Port Vale 
I actually went for a medical at Port Vale and um, obviously they flagged up the knee and then they said, we're going to have to ask the surgeons and mm -hmm. things like this. And it came back, you know, I, was, I think I knew I was never passing that medical, mm -hmm. um, but they confirmed it. They were like, we just can't take the risk on the knee. Mm -hmm. So we're sorry, we can't give you a contract. So I was, then I retired. Um, it didn't really, you're sitting there when the season started and you're still talking to players and mm -hmm. it's surreal because you still think you're a footballer. Mm -hmm. And probably a couple of months and the season had started and I still hadn't, I didn't have anything to do. Mm. And I was just like, well, wow, what do I do? Mm. And then I think I did go into a little bit of depression, mm. but knew that I had to keep busy. So I actually went out to America with a couple of players and did a little bit of coaching mm. out there um, and then came back. That was more for me. That was probably just running away from the fact that yeah. I'd, I wasn't a, a football player anymore. And then came back again and knew I had to get busy again because you just... Well, you, you have, yeah, you got family, right? I'm sure during this period, you that's when you met Gemma. I'd already, um, with Gemma, we'd not quite had any uh, any family yet. It was two years previous, two years before that. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say it was a struggle for a good five, yeah. six years after retiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not as in I would sit there crying all the time or be a manic depressive, I think. Probably some of the behaviours I did, you know, you could probably tell there was something not quite right, but I had no idea what to do. Mm. And the reason why I am where I am today is because during Coventry, during our time at Coventry, and you can vouch for this, we had a, a guy called Darren Grucott who would take us in the gym and show us about muscle and show us about growing muscle and performance and things mm. like that. And because I was injured mm. a lot more, I was with Darren a lot S more. Snap, <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. So. It, it, then I got a little bit of a love for how the body works and performing muscle and building muscle. And as soon as I finished, I was just like wrecking my brains. What do I do? What do I do? And it was just like, right, well, I, I love that side of it. The performance mm. aspect, the body, how it works. And that's when I was like, right, let's get some qualifications around training people, training myself mm -hmm. and see where it goes. And that's where I did the qualifications mm. and, and came down this route. Exactly. Yeah. So I know we've got to be so conscious of uh, time beats so I really respect your time so um, just keep a, pe people a summary as well since um, you've obviously stopped football you obviously went from personal training obviously now your hands on with built to last um, kept yourself in phenomenal shape you want 40 40 41 41. 42 this year so <laughs> why'd you have to say that I'm, well I'm the big four row we're, we're celebrating the birthday together but um but what what do you feel because obviously the has kept you in shape because we know both so many people we play football with and there's no judgment also we're helping a few people now inside built to last aren't we you know which is amazing you know who we played football with and have lost focus with the health and fitness etc but um what do you feel has been testament to keeping you in shape for all these years i mean 42 i mean uh, <laughs> you don't look it and and how important are like your habits and stuff now your lifestyle habits because you we spoke about this on the car on the way over. We both had enormous issues with alcohol, with binge drinking and stuff, and all or nothing characters and things like that. But what do you think of the fundamentals that have kept you in the shape you are, uh, Craig? And obviously now, helping other people do the same. Uh, what what what's kept you in shape whilst also having three kids, you know, a partner to think about, and you also manage managing a football team as well. Like what 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 what's the secret if there is any? Well, the secret, there's no secret to consistency. Uh, and I, I think I heard it the other day, there's intensity, there's there's consistency, but consistency trumps, trumps everything. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, I'd, I've not always been like this, you know, finishing football, I wasn't in a great place and, and I wasn't even in that good a shape, not mm. to the, the stranger looking at me would have, would have said I was in, in shape, but... Mm. Um, yeah, I think it was a progression over from when I retired to this point I am today and to where I'm going to go in the future. It doesn't stop. Mm. So it's part of me. It's what I do. So irrelevant what crops up, family, career, mm. you know, my health comes first. And how, how would you, for those listening, obviously there's a lot of people listening who have children. Like you say, they, they, they run a business. They've got stuff. They've got a lot on. How do you specifically make sure, without question, across the week you get your sessions in, you eat healthy food? Uh, do you plan your week a certain way or is it just certain time or just no matter what you pivot? Just elaborate specifically on what makes you so consistent. Yeah, I think, don't get me wrong, I haven't got all these like pinpointed. Yeah, yeah, you know, I could definitely be more um, present with family. 
um, wife would say that. <laughs> Obviously, I can definitely, sometimes I need to do more with kids, with, with the kids and be present. I'm sure everyone can improve at these things. Though. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, planning, planning your week, knowing that, if I plan the week, obviously, if you, if you plan your week, things get done. But for me, I think the difference is also, if I didn't quite plan my week as I should have done, yeah. it's still not an excuse for my habits to be not on point. So if I didn't plan where I was going to train with you today, yeah. at some point I'm training today. Yeah. Like, that's a fact. Yeah. Even if I didn't feel like it. Yeah. Because it's part of who you are and what you do. Exactly. So, so I suppose the takeaway for that for anyone listening is, if you feel that training eating healthy isn't quite to the standard that you want it to be and it's not genuinely in your heart who you are and what you do then you have no choice but to make sure that you're planning that behavior until it is absolutely absolutely until it's something that you just do so you go on holiday it's something i do yeah like and yeah wife might think she'll kill me she's like oh you're leaving me with the kids yeah, they are. I'm leaving you with the kids. I'm going to be 45 minutes, but I have to do this because otherwise yeah. I ain't going to be great for the, for the, until I get it done. Well, so what you're saying is basically there, and this is where we, we, we were obviously trying to install this now and built to last clients is you can give more to that relate relationship in the time you are with them. If you're a happier Craig, energized Craig yeah, and a more confident Craig, and I'm pretty sure the kids look up to your behavior as well. You know, that from a role model behavior perspective. Yeah. They, you know, just through me doing it though, kids watch, they're a great kids are very clever in, looking at actions of what people do around them you know mm. if you swear a lot your children are going to probably mm. swear mm, mm, mm. um if you exercise my my kids understand exercise mm. they understand you know if they're eating something they probably will be able to tell you what's a carbohydrate a protein and a fat on a mm. plate mm. um so they understand they will mimic me so they'll pretend mm. livy's four she'll pretend she'll say to mummy i'm i'm doing what daddy does and she'll be doing a burpee on the floor or mm. a press up Mm. So this is underst- not that I'm doing this that they, I want them to be like that. I'm it's just what I do. So they pick these things up, and it's nice to see that they're picking these little things up. That's gonna stand them in good stead going forward. So yeah, it's it's doing things so that they're part of you. And the repetition, always repetition, even from football, it, it's the repetition creates the habits, and and then the consistency is then what creates what results you get and for me results were a byproduct Mm. for me now i do it for health wellness longevity Mm. to look and feel good for as long as possible uh, as i can so to look better to feel good to be energized to be an optimized me at every point with my children my wife uh, and things like that and the byproduct is i get a good body then that's tick Mm. but i got a blood clot you know i've had two blood clots now and when you've got a health issue the only thing you want is your health. Mm. Like you don't want anything other than your health back, mm. no matter what it is. And I just, you know, you have that little scare and and you suddenly realize that you, your health is delicate. Because at the time of getting a blood clot, it was, you know, I was, I was really, really fit. And you know, your health can definitely, with exercise, nutrition and things mm. like that, and mindset, you can, you can have an impact on your health now before things crop up. Not yeah. to say that it will prevent things from pro- cropping up, but you give yourself a way better opportunity to live a better life and to come up and battle against things that crop up in the future if you're an optimised you. Exactly, because there are things you can't control, life circumstances, random illnesses. I know there's some, the stat for cancer is ridiculous. It's like one in two. Those are things maybe you can't control, but why are you in a position to control certain behaviours, how you eat, how you train, how you move, how you sleep? God, your chances of handling these things, if any curveball comes along, you know, are a lot more effective. So, mm. Craig, uh, we'll end with what? What's the what's the driving? What's the motivation moving forward? For me, yeah, is just to be the best version of me, really, going forward to help. You know, we've got a mission we're built to last. I love that. Mm. Um, so I'm I'm locked in for that, brother. No, I'm very, I'm very grateful. As I said, I mean, what we've what we've got in Built to Last, I mean, I, I think it's, it's very, very special what we're building. I mean, some of the people we work with are unbelievable. We spoke about on the car on the way over, are unbelievable people, business owners, etc. They've made us level up. And it's a very addictive thing, isn't it? When, even when Craig come on board, you know, we joked about it. He said, Kurt, you've made me up my game. I went, the op- <laughs> it's the feeling's mutual. Mm. And then we've got obviously sponsors like you, Mustafa's and Richard Porter. So I think one of the big takeaways from this for me is from your story, Craig, and obviously even from the built to last work we're doing is 
you, you know, if you're the, the biggest the biggest fish in the pond, or if you feel like you're the smartest in the room, the strongest, the fittest in the room, chuck yourself in, into an environment where you're not. Because your story, Craig, has been testament that whenever you do that, you cannot fail to create opportunities uh, to do that. So, Craig, mate, I'm sure we'll do this again. Um, I'd love to keep, I mean, you could talk for ages. Um, but yeah, where, where can people find you, Craig, as well, on social media, etc. Uh, social media is just at my name, Craig Peed. And that's pretty much it, really. I have Twitter, um, but yeah, it would just be Instagram and Facebook. It's just my name. Per perfect. So I want to thank Craig once again. As I say, he's been a massive part of the growth of our Built to Last results that you see on the front end. Um, and one thing I love about uh, Craig is because you, when you come from a professional sport background, your standards are there ingrained in you. And I think whether I've had dips, you've had dips, when it's hardwired into your, your identity, if that's who you are at your best, and I'm sure if you're a business owner listening to this, uh, you will resonate with that feeling when you know you're underperforming and stand of the slip. You know, just remember who you are at your best. And I know you, Peds, mate, you're an absolute savage. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. And I will see you next time.